So probably the most common question that I get asked is what I do about pests and diseases. And to be honest, I take a pretty relaxed approach to it. So I, I basically have a kind of philosophy around live and let live and diversification. So I expect some losses to pests and diseases and I grow an intentional surplus that gives me a little bit of uh, a buffer to make sure that we never run out of food. We're never not in abundance but the people who kind of suffer from as a result of the fact we get a few pests and diseases are our family and they don't mind so much because everything is a bonus to them and they get a pretty good diet uh, but they do go to the supermarket as well we don't go to the supermarket because they go to the supermarket if we have any shortages they just top up it's not a problem for them second thing is diversification so we do for our most important crops like to grow in multiple locations and we grow multiple varieties and we use multiple sowing times and planting times and when you do all those three things then a lot of the risks of kind of pests and diseases are again mitigated to some extent because it's very unlikely that with those three variables that a pest is going to strike everything in all the locations all the different varieties and all the different planting times and it's the same um, with uh, diseases so we don't stop there though we do use some protection nets and things like that and we do use nematodes so we have just about ten thousand pounds worth of produce a year and so it's worth investing about a hundred pounds i think in nematodes it's you know a tiny percentage of the uh, allotment um, you know financial yield and it just takes the pressure off a little bit again there's no like those other two strategies it's not perfect um, nematodes are helpful they contribute but they don't solve the problem of pests you know so for example we use nematodes to try and mitigate the problems with carrot root fly but we also use nets and so if we get an issue where we didn't put the nets on early enough or while we were weeding some stuff got in or something like that then the nematodes are there as a kind of like a backup um, with onion fly as I say the multiple varieties multiple locations reduces the risk of onion fly wiping out the whole crop but we also use nematodes because obviously we don't want to lose any of the crop and nematodes help with that and one of the nice things about the nematodes that we use which is mainly the fruit and veg protection one from nemesis is that it works against cabbage root fly um, carrot fly and onion fly so they're the three main pests that we worry about um, in the root zone in the soil uh, and so it's, it's quite useful for that and it w treats 60 square meters and I'm about to do that one today which is why I'm sort of dwelling on it a little bit uh, and I'll show you how I do that as well so okay that's the preamble over that's the kind of approach we take as I say I try to be quite relaxed about it I don't worry about it I don't overthink it um, and uh, you know as I say I, I, well I also rely quite a lot I should say on natural predators so for example in the polytunnel the doors are always open there's no mesh on the doors I'm not trying to keep pests out um, basically I'm trying to encourage predators in and I take that same approach generally on all of my beds so let's have a look around so in the polytunnel as mentioned I try just to get as many uh, predators in here as I can I don't try and keep the pests out though and you know I want the whole environment to be nice and well ventilated I generally use the polytunnel at this time of year in particular really more like a cloche than um, a greenhouse so you know I, I generally have these doors open it's a bit chilly today so I've only got one of the doors open uh, we're quite fortunate that just out here we've got this huge laburnum I think it is and as soon as that comes into flower it just attracts thousands and thousands of hoverflies and quite a lot of them find their way in here right now there's not many hoverflies in here but there's not very many pests I generally find the pests tend to focus on the plants that I have in containers that are also the early ones 
So I think early in containers are much more likely to have pests. And so I move those outside. I don't treat them for the pests. I just find that once they're outside, it's not too much of a problem. Early in the season, when there's not many pests, well, it's when there's plenty of pests around and not many predators, I just generally spray things with this stuff. So this is just a garlic spray. Um, I sometimes make up my own. I just use the same uh, containers for it as the original ones that I bought. And basically I just liquidize the garlic and uh, strain out the pulp and use the resultant water uh, in here. Just spray it around onto all the leaves. And that seems to do a good job uh, as a preventative. I don't think it's a curative. So if something's already got infested, it probably doesn't do very much. But as a preventative, it seems to work pretty well. So that's kind of what I do in the polytunnel. Now, if it did get a really bad infestation, then I would just use soapy water. And if it was, you know, really bad, which I've never had, then I would add neem oil to that soapy water. And details of that are in the ebook, which is linked in the description. So right now I'm doing nematodes. I've just mixed this bottle up with the fruit and veg protection nematode and I've put it in the bottle because um, I've used the rest of it at home. So there's enough for 60 square meters in a single container. Uh, so I've mixed all this up and so there's about 40 meters worth in here. That's kind of what I've got to treat. So I just pour it into one of my water butts. I'm just gonna use it as a dip tank, wash the bottle out. And basically there's enough water there to treat 40 square meters. I find it so much easier to do that than it is keep on measuring it out of the bottle. Uh, I just dip my watering tank, my watering can in there. And uh, you know, just the turbulence from dipping your water tank, watering can in there is enough to keep it all really well mixed. I don't have any protection on my onions other than this uh, nematode mixture and that seems to work for me i don't really have very many problems i've got uh, some more onions here um, one of the nice things about doing your onions at this really high density is that uh, you can put a really good dose of nematodes on these if you had them spaced out at sort of you know a quarter of this density which a lot of people do obviously then you'd need four times as many nematodes to cover the same area. For newly sown carrots I just put this cold frame top on that's a net and it's not a perfect solution but because I'm taking it on and off quite a lot in the early days because I'm just trying to get everything weed free uh, it's quite useful to just be able to lift it straight off and then just pop it back on again. As soon as I've got it reasonably weed free which is sort of two or three weeks later uh, then I'll put a full net on that goes all the way down to the ground and these beds will also be protected with nematodes. Mm. Brassica plants do go under nets and they're either these sort of fine nets made using this scaffold fabric which is quite good um, but my preference actually is just standard butterfly netting and I prefer this because I can see in, I can see what's going on, I can see what's under the leaves if there's any white fly, cabbage aphid or anything like that, you can see a little bit of white fly on there. I can keep an eye on it and I can manage it from a on a day-to-day -day basis. I know exactly what's going on. And right now I do have a net on that isn't that sort of butterfly netting. And of course you can see here, I can't see what's happening. So I really don't like these sort of fine nets. Um, I just happen to run out of nets uh, for this size of bed. So I had to use this one. But um, yeah, I, I don't like to do this. I really much prefer to just have butterfly netting because my main problem is actually cabbage aphid on this site. So here you can see another really big bed. This is our Colette bed. We've actually got Colettes in four different locations because they're our, our most important winter brassica. Um, and these are pushing to the top of the nets now. So we leave the nets quite loose, so there's plenty of space for them to push up. And obviously we do know that there's a risk that the butterflies will just lay their eggs through the netting. But we're a bit chilled really about that because we're generally down on the plot, at least for 
half an hour a day uh, in the evenings just to do a bit of watering and a bit of tidy up and so we generally would spot a problem with butterflies if they um, were around uh, we will take this net off though in about mid July and after that we'll use BT to control uh, any problems that we might have but we generally don't have too many if we get a bad infestation we'll just pull the leaf off and uh, chuck it in the bin um, and as I say you know every couple of weeks we'll spray with BT if we can get a window when it's not raining because that tends to be the problem for us in August it's uh, raining every other day and th so that's uh, a bit of a problem because BT just washes off the leaves. We do get a bit of a problem with leaf beet, beet miner and you can see that on this leaf here we don't really do anything apart from just take the leaves off but uh, it's not so much of a problem at this time of year this is our storage crop um, and the uh, early crops had much more of a problem. I don't do anything with cabbage root fly I don't put collars on because they just blow off in the wind, it's so windy here. Um, but I think the, the nets help, and as I said, the fruit and veg protection nematode, that kills the cabbage root so We don't protect strawberries and blueberries and things like that from birds. We have plenty of birds, but what we find is that because the birds like, land here, they can't reach the strawberries. They don't really like landing, obviously, on this lush canopy of strawberries, so that's not a problem. They don't like the fact they've got all this garlic kind of waving around. Um, so we generally hardly ever get a problem with strawberries. Um, and if we do, we just accept it. But it literally is like five strawberries out of this whole bed, out of the whole season, that we'll lose to birds. So carrots one of the things that's a real pest for carrots are slugs and snails and they will just strip a carrot bed so what we tend to do is we just put maybe five or six um, slug pellets in here obviously with the net on here so any dead slugs won't be eaten by the birds and uh, that makes a difference so we generally don't lose any of our carrots to slugs Generally our strategy for slugs is keep the beds clear of um, weeds and things like that. Make sure that we keep an eye out for slugs and snails when we're harvesting. And obviously we're harvesting every week. And uh, yeah, apply nematodes in April and September. And that seems to be enough to keep the volume under control. We still have snails, we still have slugs but we're not really losing any crops to them, so we don't mind. To apply the nematodes, I just use this um, with big holes drilled in it. Uh, this makes it just really easy to get the nematodes out. They don't block up the holes that they otherwise would in a fine rose. Because I've got a whole watering can with the nematodes distributed in it, I can put down a lot of water, basically, and giving them a full watering with water that's infused with the nematodes and so I don't need to come back and give them a good watering in because effectively they've already had their uh, weak supply of water. Now just like any watering when you're watering in nematodes it's best to do it on a nice cloudy day and that's actually the same with BT. Do it on a cloudy day or do it uh, at night because sunlight degrades it, makes it less effective. I do think a little bit about uh, pests when I'm planting. So in this case, for example, I've got parsnips interplanted into onions. And the reason that I do that is they share the same nematode. So the carrot fly, which affects the parsnips, and the onion fly, uh, they're a different pest, but they're treated with the same nematode. So I can treat the same one bed uh, and it deals with both pests. And maybe there's a little bit of an effect in terms of the kind of barrier effect, like all these onions kind of discouraging 
the uh, the fly from getting to the parsnips as I'm sitting here I can just see yet another one of these heat treated onions going from sets that's going to seed not good and I also plant my leeks under the same nets as the brassicas uh, although we don't really get onion moth here I think we're too far north at the moment although obviously with climate change it probably won't be very long before onion moth gets here not onion moth, leek moth gets here. So when it comes to diseases, I take, take the similar sort of relaxed approach, the same diversification and all that sort of thing that I just talked about. I also just try and keep things really well ventilated. I try to water in the morning. I try to keep the water off the leaves, particularly things like cucumbers, tomatoes and the like. Um, I, or I water at night into the root zone of the plants. Uh, which is really good because I use these halos in the polytunnel, which means I can water at night really nicely. Um, and yeah, that's, <laughs> that's basically it. I don't do a lot with diseases. As I say, just ventilation, keep the soil healthy, keep the plants healthy, keep them well hydrated. Don't try and minimise like variations in, te you know, extremes of temperature that weaken the plant. So up in the roof canopy up here, I've got a mylar blanket just to keep the midday sun. Uh, moderated a little bit in the polytunnel as you saw I've got quite a few things like brassicas and things that are under nets uh, they're also in shady beds so that they get a little bit of shade again from the midday sun so that's generally the approach that I take as I say it's not very relaxed it's not very impressive um, but it it works and I, you know I always get a good yield um, our losses I would say are down kind of maybe around five percent of harvest totals or something like that so pretty minimal really we won't really think about it too much i'll just talk about a little bit about a few disasters that we have had though um, and so one of them was a big problem with aphids on the peppers when they were inside in the conservatory at home last year and in the end we had to deal with that with neem oil and soapy water and that cleared it up and getting them out in the ground um, as well rather than in containers that made a big difference i think so one of the other things is we lost probably 70 percent of our uh, brussels sprouts last year and that was because we were using a fine net we couldn't see the cabbage aphid in there so I didn't notice maybe the leaves were curling a little bit more than they normally do uh, and I just ignored it and I thought you know, they're just, you know, they're just, just thought of it just as an observation really the leaf curl and because they always do curl a little bit um, but there was just a little bit more curl on them than usual anyway when I took the nets off just to kind of investigate after about a few weeks of noticing this slight change um, yeah, just a horrible infestation of cabbage aphid and it also affected their red cabbages. Well, so now our red cabbages are outside in the front garden where we can keep an eye on them every day. We don't tend to get many pigeon problems in the front garden. They like the back garden more uh, and they like the allotment a lot more. So just observation basically, just keep an eye on those red cabbages now is all we do. Uh, looking for caterpillars and obviously we're watering those with the nematode for the um, cabbage root fly but yeah so this time the Brussels sprouts are under a coarser net so just butterfly netting I can see straight through it I can see any problems so um, yeah that's um, that's made a big difference there so we always have a lot of problems here with carrot root fly even when I water with nematodes it's still not enough uh, the only solution really I think is here in our location where it's really bad is a combination of really disciplined netting so that means getting the nets on really early hardly ever having them off so if they're off they only come off late at night and we're in there do a quick weed and they're back on again um, and as I say I also apply nematodes I've tried uh, right now I'm actually trying growing them about one and a half meters off the ground and there's still some of them getting carrot fly so this idea that you can put a little net up or something about a meter high and the, the carrot fly won't fly over it because they're low, low flying, it's just, it's just not true. 
Um, and that's not just my experience, that's backed up by experience from the RHS when they did their field trials of all sorts of different ways of protecting from carrot flight and the only thing that works, and even then it's not 100%, is fine netting, mesh grade netting. So that's what we use, and as I say, we're pretty disciplined about it, and if you're just not disciplined then you think, oh, I'll put it on when the carrots are this high or something like that. No, you're gonna get a carrot fly on our allotment site if you do that. You've gotta put it on before they break surface. So anyway, that's uh, an important lesson learned with carrot fly. Uh, one of the big problems that we have is with uh, cutworms, and they really can decimate a lettuce crop and just run through like, from one lettuce to the next. And people say, well, you can dig around and find them. Uh, I often find that by the time you've, the lettuce has keeled over, it's mo the cutworms move to another lettuce and you don't know where it's moved, so you'd end up digging all your lettuces up. What we use is that same nematode, so it's really nice. Again, that same fruit and veg protection nematode kills cutworms and chafer grubs and things like that. So that's really good and we are no dig here. Uh, I hardly ever talk about it because I don't think it's really that important, but we've chosen to go no dig just because I'm lazy. Um, there are many allotment sites here that aren't no dig that do fantastically well. Um, you know, there's, there's no fantastic, no one great way of gardening. Um, there's lots of different ways. Uh, but we happen to be no dig and um, that's really bad, I think, for cutworms because you're not turning the soil over. The birds aren't coming in and pecking through and taking them out. Uh, obviously, because you're not turning the soil, you're not seeing them and you can't hand pick them out either. Uh, they're just under the soil. You know, you never see them because uh, you're never disturbing the soil. Um, but, as I said, that fruit and veg protection nematode w is great for that. And so when we do new sowings in particular, so in September, um, when we're putting all of our winter lettuces in, uh, we make sure we put this fruit and veg protection nematode down. Um, and it's a lot better to put it down when the plants are young as well, uh, when you can actually get to the soil, because once they're this sort of size, you can't, you can't get around them to the, to the soil. So um, yeah, so that's important. We have had a problem with uh, gray mold on the gooseberries. And again, that comes down to ventilation. So a lot of these things are down to not packing your plants in too closely, giving them lots of ventilation. In our case, it was a fence that was just stopping the air flowing through. And when we took the fence down, it was much better. So, you know, things like that. We do get blight on the potatoes, so what I try to do is I grow charlottes as my first early and second early and early main crop, and they're moderately resistant to blight, but they're generally harvested by the time blight strikes, because it's generally sort of September, October time for us. And so I do Sarpa Mira for harvesting the September, October period, and they're quite resistant to blight, although we do get a different type of uh, fungal infection on the sarpamiras, which is not ideal, but anyway, we still get a harvest, although they look a little bit of a mess. Um, for our late crop, we also do charlotte, and most people put those in the ground in August, and they uh, take 120 days, so that's all of August, all of September, all of October, all of November, so you're harvesting them in December for Christmas, so that's why they're called Christmas potatoes. We don't do that. We put ours in in July, and because they're growing in the summer, they're not 120 days. So you get a good crop even after sort of 90 days. So that's all of July, all of August, and all of September. So we're generally, they, they sometimes do get blight in September, but by then we've got a decent crop out of them. We just take the tops off the horns um, and just stack them up in the greenhouse so they don't get too sodden wet in winter and we just leave them in the compost and we harvest those all the way through sort of November, October, De December, January, February, March, and then we get our new season potatoes in April. So that's how we deal with blight. I don't have club root on my site, although there's a lot of club root around on the allotment in general. Um, and so I don't have to deal with it. And I also don't rotate. And so, I mean, that's cardinal sin in some ways. But the reason I don't rate, rotate is just a practical one. It's just impossible for me to do it. I grow 250 different varieties of fruit and veg. And I often grow four, sometimes five 
sometimes six successions out of the same patch of land uh, in a year. So that is thousands of different permutations and combinations of fruit and veg, all different types in the ground all the time. So, and I also interplant. So I might have not just five successions, but I might have two interplants in there as well. So it might be seven or even, you know, even more. So it's just, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's completely impossible to keep track of all of those things and make sure that you're not following brassicas with brassicas or whatever. Just, it's just not practical. Uh, and so I gave up long ago just doing that and I just take a little bit of care now so that, for example, my favourite kind of rotation is I'll probably do uh, brassica and then I'll follow, so summer brassica, maybe summer kale or something like that, and I'll follow that with field beans and that enriches the ground with uh, nitrogen so that when I come to plant brassicas again, uh, you know, the brassicas love that nitrogen that the field beans put into the ground. So that's the kind of thing that I'll do. I'm mainly just thinking about what can I do in terms of changing the type of crop in order to optimize the yield and get a good successional timing going. And so another good one like that is perhaps I can harvest my winter Brussels sprouts and collets in March and that's a perfect timing then to put onions in in April. So I'm not really thinking so much about rotations as I'm thinking about what naturally follows something else in terms of timing. Um, and yeah, that's just generally the approach that I take. And so another great example would be uh, broad beans which naturally and, and garlic which naturally finish at the time when I want to plant my purple sweat and broccoli. So I have all of these rotations in mind um, but they're all really timing based or they're designed to improve the ground or they're a great interplant for some other reason. So that's just the approach that I take. As I say I've never had a problem with plants and diseases ever apart from in my perennial beds with these gooseberries so I don't know I've only been gardening five years so oh, nearly six but I mean that's just you know I've just never had a problem so I just don't worry about it um, so the story that I tell myself um, to make me less concerned about not rotating is that when plants grow in a healthy soil that's full of fungi and bacteria, the, they grow in symbiosis. And so the plants grow a fungal and, and bacterial community around them that suits the plants. And so the plants grow well, and if the plants grow well, and they put a lot of exudates into the soil, sugars basically, excreted from the roots of the plant into the soil. And the fungi and the bacteria, they feed off that, and then they produce nutrients that feed the plant. And to, so that grows a healthy plant and the healthy plant puts more exudates into the soil and so they grow together and so if you rotate and put a completely different type of plant in that bed then all of that fungal and bacterial um, composition of the soil that's evolved over a six or nine month period all gets to all dies off effectively to some extent and the composition of the soil adjusts to suit the new plant. And if you're constantly doing that, um, breaking down one, one community of soil microorganisms and repopulating with another one, each time you do a rotation, then effectively there's plenty of opportunity for pathogens to take hold in that soil. Because one soil community is dying off and whilst the new one is kind of regrowing, there's a chance that pathogens might get established. If you don't rotate, and for example, you do always grow in brassicas in the ground all the time, although you might have other interplants in there, uh, or you're only having a small number of a couple of months without brassicas, for example, then what potentially happens, and the science is extremely poorly developed on this, so I mean, it's just effectively an old man's tale at this point, is that the soil microorganisms are extremely healthy you know the plants are healthy the soil microorganisms are very healthy 
And if a pathogenic microorganism, fungi or bacterial, tries to take hold within that already healthy community, it's outcompeted by that healthy community. And as a result, you don't get a buildup of soil diseases because of that, because you're not rotating, because you've not got this you know, expansion of the community and then contraction when you put, put another rotation in there. And then three years later, it expands again because it's brassicas and then it contracts over those, that three year period and then it expands again in another three years because you haven't got that expansion there isn't that opportunity for other microorganisms to get in there and get established so that's effectively the theory the story really i think it, it gives it too much credit to call it a theory um that's the, the, the story that i tell myself and so in some ways i want to do the opposite of uh, rotation i want to keep a bed with alliums in it all the time to keep that community of bacteria and fungi that likes growing with alliums in there always healthy always ready to outcompete the pathogens um who knows whether that's true now the other thing is <coughs> because i try and keep my beds well hydrated but also not over hydrated and i do that because of the covers that i've got uh, which means lots of watering in summer uh, but not very much watering in winter so everything stays at similar sort of hydration levels optimum hydration levels all year round that also means that you're not you're not again challenging the soil microbiota uh, if you've got soil that gets really saturated so there's no oxygen in the soil then all of the lovely aerobic oxygen loving um, bacteria and fungi that we have in the soil in the spring and summer and autumn they all die off effectively they don't they're not killed completely but they kind of go into uh, hibernation you might say uh, in winter and again that means in spring when they're coming out of that hibernation period there's an opportunity for other pathogenic microorganisms to take hold and maybe outcompete the good ones because those are just coming out of hibernation keep your soil levels at optimum levels and they never but they never die off they're always there still growing and of course the other thing is always having living roots in the soil so i always like to do that uh, wherever i can i snip my plants off and leave the roots in the soil sometimes they get in the way so i take them out but so i'm not obsessed about it but I tr that's what i try to do anyway is try to leave those roots in the soil to decay but more importantly, always try to have some living roots in the soil because the soil microorganisms feed on the exudates from the roots of living plants. And if, again, if you take the living plants out of the soil and so you've just got bare soil, there's nothing to feed those microorganisms. They don't feed on the compost, they feed on the sugars that are released from the roots of the soil. Uh, sorry, the roots of the soil, from the sugars that are released from the roots of the growing plants. So that's kind of my approach, I guess you would say, uh, overall to pests and diseases. So I do have a section in my ebook about pests. I don't actually have one about diseases because I don't do anything particularly special about diseases. But anyway, you can find it in the basic section. Just scroll down there and it's dealing with pests. And this is just the general kind of approach, the overview which is kind of what I'm running through in this video as well. And go through just the things I've talked about there and then some specific sort of hints and tips about what I do. And in each of the individual growing guides, which you can find uh, under individual growing guides in the book, then when I write those, I am also putting specific guidance in for pests and diseases related to uh, each of these individual types of plant so i hope you found this interesting my name is steve this is the seaside kitchen garden and allotment channel and i'll see you soon